Cricket Laugh Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Today we're joined by Adrian McKinman. How are you doing, Adrian? Cool, mate. Um, so, Adrian, you're a cricket psychologist. You're a man of varied experience. You've got seven university qualifications. You've got a black belt in three different uh, was it styles of Kung Fu. You've got three citizenships as well. Worked <laughs> around the country. You've been involved in numerous cricketing associations, including work with Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Zimbabwe. Can you just briefly uh, tell us how many years you've been involved in the field of cricket psychology and, uh, and the various teams that you've actually been involved and trained in? You're trying to make me feel like an old man now, buddy, huh? Uh, yeah, I have many tentacles. I've done, done many things. Uh, I guess it all goes back to 1990 when I did my first master's in sports psychology and ever since then I've been working in the industry. Um, you've mentioned some of the international teams. I've also worked with a number of provincial teams in South Africa. I've worked in, in Rajasthan with India. Um, I've even worked in very small and obscure strange places like I've worked with um, Ghana in West Africa, their cricket national team. You would never think they would have a cricket team, but they do. I also worked, worked um, in Botswana. It only has two million people and you can't expect there to be much of a cricket team, but I worked with them and that, actually it was quite cool. Um, but as you say, I've worked with Zimbabwe and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and Afghanistan as well. So I've, I've been around, I've um, done quite a few interesting things and it's, it's been really good. So an interesting career. What kind of attracted you into getting into this field? Oh, if, if you go back to 19, gee, now I really am showing my age, eh? Uh, 1982. In 1982, I was going, I went to a conference on sports psychology in, in Otago. I was an 18 year old and I, I was in awe by a man called Cal Botterill. And frankly, what it was, it was just my, my, my age. I was just so young and naive. So I saw this guy in a suit talking elegantly and I just said, wow, I'd love to be like that. And then, frankly, he could have been talking about biology. It really wouldn't have made a difference. I would have gone off and done biology to a certain extent, I think. But it, it, I was just so in awe, like, wow, look at the confidence of this guy. And gee, I wish I had that confidence. So that was part of it. And also, you know, I was an athlete. I, was, I played state hockey and I played state app track and field, etc. And so being able to bring the psychology into my sport actually helped as well. So you mentioned the word confidence. This is a four-part series we're going to do. This is episode one. We're going to focus on confidence. So Adrian, can you just kind of give us a definition in your your perspective, what is actually confidence? Well, let's just keep it simple. It's, 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 it's just basically the, the degree to which you believe you can do something. So if you're a coach and you are talking about confidence with regard to giving a speech to the players, it's, it's simply the degree to which you believe you can give that speech. And if you're a player and um, you need to score X number of runs in X number of balls, the confidence is simply the degree to which you believe you can do that. And can it be taught? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you, you look a little bit older than, an, than a baby, right? So, but, so you think about when you were a baby and you think about where you are now. There's obviously a huge difference. When you were a baby, you, had, you were not an expert in anything. You could not eat solids. You, you maybe could cry, uh, you couldn't even use the toilet properly. Yeah, you couldn't do anything much. But with a little bit of time and a little bit of exposure and modeling and watching and copying and modeling and copying and watching, you end up having a degree of success. And over time, you would gain an appreciation of confidence because of the success. Now, you can quicken that up a little bit if you go see a, see a coach. So it could be a music coach or it could be a cricket coach, it could be whoever. And if you take on board what they say and they truly are experts, well, then you will learn to get better in a quicker period of time. And if you get better at something, that leads open to the possibility of then gaining confidence. Now, if you see somebody like me, you can do it even quicker. Because what I will do is I'll teach you how to become even more confident in a quicker, shorter period of time and the more confidence you have, the more you're likely to put your foot out, give things a go, try things. And if you fail, don't worry, because you've got enough confidence that you can carry on and carry on. And as you keep stepping forward, stepping forward, stepping forward, 
Next thing you know, you're more likely to have the success, which leads to the possibility to have confidence and genuine confidence. So then is a lack of confidence or sometimes overconfidence a result of external and internal in external or internal factors? Oh, absolutely. But at the end of the day, what is confidence? Confidence is just a thought. I think I can do it. I think I cannot do it. And so at the end of the day, yes, there's external things on you, but largely they don't matter. What it really matters is, is the internal. For instance, if um, a coach is giving you really good quality, positive feedback, positive reinforcement and doing everything they possibly can to help you grow as a person, but you don't internalize it, you don't accept it, you don't take it on, well then all their great work isn't really gonna do anything and your, your confidence won't change. Likewise, if a whole lot of people say negative things about you, I remember one of the boys in Sri Lanka, at one stage he was going through quite a bad per period by social media and, the, and the, the print media, and he was taking that on board. And so as a result, that was before I, I met him. And so as a result, his confidence went down, but it didn't need to. If you are really strong, now let's take somebody, I don't know, um, Fab Duplessis, and let's take uh, MS Dhoni. Uh, so far from South Africa, Dhoni from India. The reality, if you're that mentally strong, you are more likely to be able to handle these external things, not allow them to affect you so that you can maintain your confidence. Now, I actually purposely chose those two guys. And the reason why I chose them is they have both, both Fav and Dhoni have come out recently and explained the amount of pressure that they believe that they're under as cricketers the difficulties that they have, the need for somebody yeah, like myself, a cricket psychologist, to help them with the mental aspects of the game. Uh, Fab, for instance, talks about the mental frailties that the pro tiers have. And Dhoni used different words, but it was in many respects the same sort of thing. It was negative psychological problems that they needed mental training with. So even if you are as strong as these guys, they will still tell you that they suffer from frankly, not being trained mentally. They can have as the best coaches out there on the planet, but usually they're not exposed to any mental training. And when they do, it's for a very short period of time and then the person goes, etc. So yes, you can train it. It's more internal than external, but yes, external factors can affect you. So how important, say, uh, for a player that's perhaps lacking confidence, how important is it that they see a coach or a captain that believes in them? For example, in this year's IPL, there's a little story that India's Jasper Bumra from the Mumbai Indians, he's saying that his confidence has been elevated due to, the, due to Rohit Sharma's captaincy and the belief in him. Do you see that as an important factor? In this oh, absolutely. Confidence and cricketers specifically? A absolutely, without a question of a doubt. Um, one of the things I try to do when I, when I work with an international team is to try and work with the coaches. Now, it's, it's oftentimes quite difficult because the coaches understand the need for mental training of the cricketers, but they don't like to really take on board the need for themselves to mentally train. Now, the reality is they usually have never had any mental training, but they've got to a nice position. They're the head coach of an international team, so they're doing really good. There's not much better they can really go. And the last thing they want is to now be talking about their weaknesses and, and how they could do better, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is if you are able, and it's not easy, but if you are able to create a relationship with a coach, then you can sometimes get them to do sessions with you. And over time, you can work on exactly what you've just said. So let me give you an example, away from cricket for a moment. We'll talk about the education world. There was a really cool study done where what they did was they, they got two schools. One school had a bunch of teachers who believed that they could have an educational impact on the kids. And then they went to a different school where the teachers did not believe that they could make an educational impact on the kids. And then they compared the children's grades in maths, English, and one other thing, I think it was writing or something, I'm, I'm, I can't remember, but it was definitely English and maths. 
And what they found was, as you can fully imagine, is the grade eight, grade eight maths and grade eight English was better in the students that had teachers who believed they could make an impact. Now, I'll give you another study now closer to cricket in the sport world with basketball. What they did with the basketball study is they got to, um, they split the players into two groups. One group had a leader who said, I believe in you, you're going to do well, I, you know, I think we're going to have a great season. It was all positive, positive, positive. But then they had a second group who were told, oh, I don't think you're going to amount to much. It's going to be a lousy season. Not much is going to happen. I, I'll, I'll be surprised if you win a single game. And then they looked to see what happened and they found three important findings. One, for the team that said, I believe in you, you can do well, the lead is really positive, their players' confidence went up. The second finding, the players that had a coach who said, I believe in you, we're going to do well, their performance went up. But sadly, and I'm sure you can now see where this is going, for the, the players that belong to the leader that said, I don't think you're going to achieve anything, well, guess what? It, their performance didn't go so well. So it's exactly the same in the cricket world. There's no difference between basketball players and cricketers in terms of those sorts of things. We all like to be encouraged positively and we don't like to have punishment. And the reality is positive reinforcement almost always works way better than punishment. And hence my point earlier point about working with the coaches. If I can help the coaches understand the how to give positive feedback, how to give positive reinforcement more, and not as much punishment, then as a result, guess what? The player's confidence goes up and the player's performance goes up. And then if we look at specific scenarios in cricket that perhaps go through all the levels, whether you be a club, school player, all the way through to the professional game, you know, say a batsman's going through a rut, not scoring many runs, or a bowler's in a spell and he's just spraying it around or not getting it quite right, or, or, or a fielder, you're in the field and you drop a catch, happens to all of us. In terms of confidence, what would you advise a player in terms of building their confidence back up when faced with the similar uh, scenario again, in, say in the next spell, the next innings or a next match or the next ball when it comes to uh, concentrating your mind in the field and anticipating a catch? Cool. Well, every cricketer has gone through this. And the one thing I would say to them, in an ideal world, what you should do is actually quite simple. Just put into place all the mental techniques that you've been training in training sessions with your cricket psychologist. Now, as I said, I preface that by saying in an ideal world, because not everybody's worked with a cricket psychologist and not everybody even wants to. But if you have practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced these routines, when life gets difficult, you just do the routine and you don't even need to think too much about it. And as a result, your confidence doesn't take a dive. So let me give you just two examples. I teach many techniques with my cricketers and coaches and admin, admin staff. And the admin staff are no different. They, they go through the same sort of issues. The coaches go through the same sort of issues. It's just a different scenario, but the issues are the same. So one of the things I teach is just a two to three second technique. Really simple to do. Uh, and it's very effective. I'll give you an example. Let's just take a different sport for a moment. I'm not going to tell you which country because that would cause me all sorts of problems. But I was working for a national football team, a soccer team. And some of the players after working with me for a few weeks came up to me and said, you know, by that stage they gained the confidence and they said, look, our biggest problem is that, and they, you know, they didn't really want to say it, but they needed to say it, that the coaches are always negative, negative, negative. They all never say anything positive, and it's draining. And so what I did, and it's almost embarrassing to say, but what I did was I taught them a technique. <laughs> Here you go, so I shouldn't say it, but to, largely to ignore the coaches. And it took a while to... To, to practice, right? Because it, it takes about 10 to 12 hours to teach. It only takes two to three seconds to do, but it takes about 10, 12 hours to do, so uh, to teach. So let me explain. Um, you, you need to learn a thing called a noise affirmation, which takes seven one hour sessions. And then you need to learn how to do a thing called diaphragmatic breathing. Then you need to know how to do thought stoppage. And then once you've got it, 
you've got yourself a technique that only takes two or three or 20 seconds, whatever, but then you need to practice it daily and daily and daily. And you only need to practice it for 10, 20, 30 seconds, maybe two times, three times a day. That's all. And be, once you've got used to doing it, then the beauty is, then you can close your eyes and imagine a time in the future that's going to be difficult and see yourself doing that foot, foot stoppage technique and handling the situation well and seeing a nice outcome. So that if something bad does come your way, you do the foot stoppage technique and it works. And your performance doesn't go down, your confidence doesn't go down, your mental toughness doesn't go down. I'll give you one other example, routines. One of the most effective things that any cricket psychologist can help cricketers with is teaching routines. And those who train with me for many, many hours, I help them create a routine when they bat, a routine when they bowl, a routine when they go out to the field and they cross the line. And another very important routine is a post-performance routine. So let me just, let, let's just go with the post-performance routine. One of the things that I am doing right now, I, I actually, yeah, let me tell you about one of my clients. I won't tell you his name, but he's trying to get into the Proteus. He, he's getting there. And what, what we do with him is he tells me a name of a bowler he wants to visualize batting against better. So let's take Mahidi Hassan, for instance. And so I send videos to my player of Mahidi. And then I send him separate videos of different cricket grounds all around the world that I have been to. And what I do is I send him videos where there's nobody on the field so that he can see the whole arena fairly clearly. And then what he does is he watches Mahidi two times, the same ball. Then he watches the, the video of a certain ground. So let's say it's Chittagong. And then he closes his eyes and he imagines playing the appropriate shot for that ball in Chittagong. Then he opens his eyes, he does it twice. Then he does the same thing, but he looks at Mahiti again, maybe a different ball or the same ball, doesn't matter, but then he looks at different grounds, so maybe this time it's um, Ketarama in uh, Colombo in Sri Lanka. And then he closes his eyes, see himself playing the appropriate shot really well now in, in Ketarama. He does that twice. And we keep doing that and keep doing it and keep doing it. So that's one way that he can do it. But the other thing is the post-performance routine is he can go home having played a, a good game or a bad game and just do a post-performance routine which is specific to the things that he likes, like his mission statement or his vision statement or his values or his purpose statement and plays those through his head so that he reminds himself, okay, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm trying to do. Don't get too cocky if I've had a great day and don't get down if I've had a bad day. So what I actually did was I sneaked in actually a bit of an idea of how you can do things that are not the post-performance routine. And then I got to the post-performance routine. So I've actually given you a few extra ideas. But the key is one simple thing. It's no different from physical training. You've got to do enough physical training to gain physically. You can't just go off and do a few push-ups and now be physically fit. Well, it's the same in the mental training. You've got to take it seriously and do enough and do it consistently. And then you'll start to get the benefits. How important, in your opinion, is clarity of mind in the moment? So, for example, a batsman plays and misses. How important is it and how easy is it for them to then refocus and basically focus on the next ball? A lot of commentators say it. But how easy is it? And that all links into confidence in terms of the, your, your confidence in terms of playing the next ball on its merits, as opposed to thinking about what's gone on in the past in terms of playing and missing, edging and just falling short, etc. What would you say on that? If you ask people, what was the best game you ever played? And that's what they tell you. And then you ask them, what were you thinking? And then what were you feeling? And then you ask them exactly the same questions in regard to their worst game. What they say in their best game, they weren't thinking much. And if they were, it was positive. And they felt really relaxed, maybe happy, maybe positive, or maybe neutral. But in the worst game, they were thinking negatively and feeling negatively. And what we find is when you are really performing well, you end up in what we call a psychological flow state. 
everything is easy. You don't think about yourself. You don't think about time. Time just evaporates, just, just wishes. And this is like an amazingly fantastic experience. You, you perceive that your abilities are up to the demands asked of you, and you just go out there and you make it happen. Your question is talking about, in effect, how do you get into that psychological flow state? And if you then play a bad ball, how do you get back into that psychological flow state as quick as possible? Now, I showed you a very concrete technique, this thought stoppage technique, that can help you stop thinking negative but it's not as effective in getting you back into a flow state. What you really need to do is a whole lot of things that gets you into this flow state and you don't want to be thinking. You don't want to be doing these concrete techniques like a thought stoppage technique because that could actually interfere with the ability to get into a flow state. You want to just be so comfortable, so confident, so relaxed, so mentally tough, you just go out there and you make it happen. And it'd be no different for a coach be no different for administrator the same thing if a ceo truly believes yeah i can do this and i can do that and they go off and do it well next thing you know hours may have gone by and they're like where did the time go it was just so effortless for them same thing for the player same thing for the coach and then you mentioned routine earlier there so alistair cook england's greatest run scorer he always said that the day before a game we'd always go and stand at the crease and just almost visualize the ball coming down, looking around, imagine the crowd there. For example, if he was playing against South Africa, imagining a day will stain coming down at him, a morning more call bouncing at him. How important is that kind of getting in that state of mind of, of almost feeling comfortable in that environment? That must link to your confidence when 24 hours later you're walking out at 11 o'clock facing the first ball of a test match. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what it sounds like he is doing is something that is really effective. I mean, I, I've never talked to him, so I don't know the nitty gritty of how he's doing it. But yes, that, that's the sort of thing that true professionals will do. I mean, for instance, um, I'll give you an example of my own life. I was in Ghana in West Africa, and I was approached to come over to Syracuse in New York State and be the keynote speaker of a conference there. And what they wanted me to do was come on a certain day. And I said, I need to be there at least one day earlier so I actually pra practice in the auditorium, get used to the acoustics, get used to the number of people, uh, number of tables and chairs, and get used to the whole environment so that on the day, I just go in there and I'll make it happen. And it, it, it's, just, it, it's, it's all about your level of professionalism. The more serious and professional you want to be, obviously there's huge growth for potential improvement. You can do amazing things when you really are serious. And it's not just the physical, it's not just training in the nets, it's not just training in the gym. The mental is so important. You ask any of the top players, they'll all tell you that once you play X number of international matches, all the extra training in the nets in the gym is not improving you. All it's doing is basically maintaining your skill level. But what you need is on the day of the game and the day before is to have a real quick clarity of mind, as you say, so that when you go out there, you are thinking about the right things at the right energy level without any distractions, and you just make it happen. So what was your views in terms of linking superstition to confidence? Because cricket is known as a sport where players are very superstitious. You hear stories of Neil McKenzie, the ex-South African, almost taping a bat to the ceiling, like Anasu Hussein who scored a double hundred against Australia, he was saying a story that he was eating a chicken masala uh, the night before the game watching Warner McGrath bowl just tapes on loop and he tried to repeat that time and time again after or Alex Stewart when he was in a bad form he'd always put on tapes of him scoring a hundred in each innings um, in Barbados. What would, what would you say on that? Oh, without a question of doubt, it's actually quite ironic that the more successful athletes compared with the less successful athletes, they tend to be more superstitious. And if you think that cricket's bad, I mean, let's just take Serena Williams. I mean, she has calmed down, but in years gone by, she would, if she didn't take her, her um, slippers or her fongs or her, I don't know what you call them in England, you know, in, into the, the bathroom, then she had a problem. If she didn't 
uh, do her shoelaces on her left leg before her right foot, etc. I can't remember all that, but it was crazy, crazy stuff. And she would say the same thing. And you think she's bad. Go back to go to where I used to live in West Africa. Oh my God. <laughs> I won't tell you which country, but the football players for one national team could not sit together all on the same table. They would be in separate tables doing juju on each other, black magic on each other. So, you know, it, it's without a question of a doubt at, at the high level, it's amazing how superstitious people are. And so as a cricket psychologist, especially from one who's come from a, you know, a, a very scientific based type of country, you know, I, I spent 20 years in Australia, 20 years in New Zealand, and, you know, I spent, what, 14 years as a student in universities. So I'm all science, 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 etc. And what you have to do is move that to the side and understand where the person's coming from. Um, oh, for instance, I'll give you one example. Um, one of the guys from Bangladesh, he was very interested in working with me, but he was just a little bit concerned that I would want to remove any religion things that he used out of his routines. Now, he was Muslim, like almost all the boys, if not all the boys. And I said, no, now the reality is that's who you are. It's part of what's got you to where you are. I have to work with who you are and with what you bring. Now, in that case, we're talking about religion. Other, some people might think that's superstitious. Others might say superstition is different from religion. But it doesn't really matter. It's, it's a thought process that you've brought with you. And interestingly, what we know of routines is that when you change an athlete's routine, very often their performance actually goes down. Now that you think, well, that's crazy. They've got a routine and what you've done is removed some things like superstition out of their routine. And you've maybe added some things that actually should work better, be it diaphragmatic breathing, affirmations, whatever. And yes, they do work, but what happens is there is an initial decrease in performance as they stop doing what they used to do and having to learn this new routine and then implement it. Give it enough time and now performance goes even better than where they were. And that's one of the things that's really important with cricket psychology is you've got to establish a really good relationship with each person separately. Because if they don't really trust you, they don't really buy into the idea that maybe performance will go down before it starts to go up. Then, of course, as soon as they see their performance go down, they'll say, oh, he's useless and they don't want to have anything to do with it. So you can't work with routines to start with. You've got to work with other things and establish rapport, establish trust. And it takes a long time. But the reality is once you've got to a certain level, you can do amazing things. And there's a lot of talk, obviously, about lack of confidence. But on the subject of overconfidence... How would you, what would you say on that in terms of a batsman or bowler still being able to execute what they have to do in, in a, uh, when their state of mind is almost overconfident? They can do, in their mind, they feel they can do whatever they, they want on, the, on, the, on that particular day, of that particular innings. Okay, well, let me throw back a question at you. Just one little one. What is overconfidence? Uh, and a tremendous inner self-belief. Okay, now let's think about those words, a tremendous inner self-belief. If you think about that, is that a bad thing? Sounds pretty good to me. If you go out as a keynote speaker at a conference, do you want to have a tremendous, what was the word you said? A tremendous uh, self-belief, yeah. right? Do you want to have that or do you want to have a bit of nervousness and, oh, I don't know if I can do it? It's pretty obvious. And what you'll find I mean, I, as soon as you said those words, I immediately thought of that guy from Afghanistan, that guy from Zimbabwe, etc. And some of these guys are so close minded and, and so cocky and sure of themselves. And they're frustrating, to be honest, because you know that you could do so much to make them better players. But the reality is they just they don't want to have a bar of it. And so, yes, you, they could do better. But the reality is their true belief in themselves has got them to where they are. So what you have to do is you basically have to leave them alone and you work with other people. When the other people start to do better, then they come along. Oh, for instance, I'll give you one example. I won't say, I won't say which uh, country. It was a cricket team. It was the, the national coach really wanted me to work with the players. So I'm working with them. And after a couple of months, He's sort of hanging outside the door and then he wanted to, they dragged him in and he sat right down the far end where 
the video is where the projector was screening onto the wall so that he couldn't see the wall because he didn't want to see, but he just wanted to see what was going on. And it was really fascinating that he so wanted the boys to be there, but he didn't want to participate. And that's what you'll find with time as people start to do better and better. Then those who are initially closed minded are going to end up wanting to participate. And the reality is that you so much you can you can do. But let's go back to the initial part of your question where it is in effect, you were saying is overconfidence a bad thing. I say no. So let me ask you one more question. Which of the three scenarios is best? This is your confidence level. And that is your skill. Your skill is below. Or that is your confidence level. And that is your skill. They're equal. Or that is your confidence level. And that is your skill. Which of those three gives you the best performance? The more balanced one, isn't it? No. No. <laughs> the one where that is your confidence and that is your skill right having slightly more confidence than you should logically have is the most effective way to be if you don't have enough confidence you won't try things you won't get out there the, the key to success is to act to give it a go the key to confidence is to give it a go and eventually you'll succeed and then you say to yourself look there's the proof for my crazy belief but if you don't have enough confidence, if your skill is here and your confidence is only here, you don't try it in the really difficult times. You mount, etc. You actually need to have more confidence than you deserve. And that's why when you actually look at some of the players in some of the international teams, they are not the most pleasant people to work with because they so believe in themselves, they come across as almost arrogant. Now, it's no different from you and me. The reality is if I want to be a really, really good cricket psychologist, or if you want to be a really, really good journalist, we actually need to have slightly more confidence than our skill. And therein lies the problem. I see your face immediately. You start to smile and you say, well, obviously there's a problem here because now people can say, oh, he's arrogant. He, he, he's full of himself. When the reality is no. And when the, if you ever get a chance, go to YouTube and type in uh, Viv Richards and hunt around eventually you'll find a video of Viv and Viv talked about how he didn't care if people thought that he was looking a little bit cocky and a little bit overconfident when he went out to bat and he looked like he had a swagger he did not care because he just believed in himself and he made it happen and so the reality is I don't really worry too much about overconfidence and I don't worry too much about if somebody appears a bit arrogant you know the, the reality is you're never going to please everybody Rembrandt arguably the best painter on the planet and yet some people would say that his stuff was horrible and who were they they were fellow competing artists so you know the reality is overconfidence is not such a problem obviously within realms if you think that you can um you know do this this and this and it's just in implausible well, that's obviously a bit different well adrian brilliant i think that wraps us up for episode one session number one of this four-part series guys remember we'll put all the links in the playlist uh once it's all done uh but yeah so that episode two will be focusing on fear but adrian brilliant session this and we'll see you guys in the next one